Okay, we're here at Whiting Farms. We're going to talk about some of the different lines of dry fly birds. And we have Dr. Whiting here. He's sneaking up on us right now. <laughs> but we have Dr. Whiting who's going to help explain the mystery. Fly fish food. A lot of people come to me and say, I'm a little bit confused. You have all these dry fly lines. You know, there's the red label Whiting line. There's a green label Hebert line, and then there's a relatively new one called the High and Dry. So I thought I'd take a few minutes just to explain the genetic lineages of these that uh, might help un people understand it. This is the Whiting line. It was derived all from the Hoffman Grizzly long ago. I have crossed other things into it to relieve the inbreeding and uh, make some new colors, but it's basically a very, very good Grizzly line. And, and then we had dominant white put into it, and that makes for a white, but it's basically a grizzly with the black canceled out, because that's what dominant white does. And they're known for their very good dry fly hackle in the cape and in the saddle. And we trim off on the breeder roosters the saddles just because it gets in the way of mating. But this guy's pretty vigorous here, but he, we're mating him on mostly grizzly hens here. But I also don't have any inhibition to mate them on white hens because um, basically these white hens are grizzlies with one gene in them and we'll get out of different colors out of them. So that's just an easy way to do that. And right now I need more white. So that's what the Hoffman is derived from or the whiting line. Now we're gonna look at the Hebert and the high and dry. Okay, now I'm going to talk about what we call the O-line, but that's where the high and dry comes from. And this derived from the early, or late 90s, early 2000s. I was getting a lot of uh, orders for commercial fly tying companies, which are a big part of our business, for just basic grizzly and white. Because that's all they really needed, and then they could dye the other colors. And I couldn't possibly do it with uh, the Hoffmans, because they're highly inbred and just not very reproductive. So I crossed another line into it to relieve the Hoffman, or the inbreeding, and we called it the O-line, because it's easier to make a dot on an egg and O well, hadn't been used. So I was producing tens of thousands of these things for the commercial fly tying company. And some of them were just so good, we would sort of skim off the top 10 or 20%, or 10 or 15% more likely, and we called that the high and dry, because it sounded like a good dry fly name, but also, a lot of the shops that we were selling to at the time were all confused by grades and all this kind of thing. So they just wanted one stock grade, a standard grade. And so by just skimming off the very best of the O-line, selling the vast majority to the commercial fly tying industry, we made the high and dry, which was just the top end of the, the O-line production. And that's where it came from. It's about three quarters Hoffman. At this point, I don't think I can even track it, trace it back but it's uh, almost as good a quality. The saddle sizes are not in the mid-range. They're mostly 14, 16, 12 in that order, because that's really what the commercial fly tying uh, companies need for their sales. So it's just a way of larger capacity production systems to uh, su supply the market in the world for it. So right now I'm just doing grizzly and white and doing brown as well now in the O-line, and that turns into the high and dry. Yeah. Well, here's one of the Hebert roosters. This is my favorite line. I just love all the colors. This is a brown dun. And there's both gray dun and brown dun, and they're genetically separate. The interesting thing about it is the gray dun is epistatic to brown, meaning it stands upon. So when you mate them together, you get gray, and now and then a, a brown dun will drop out but it doesn't work the other way. You never get a gray dun out of the brown dun. But anyway, I, uh, this line goes back to Harry Darby, then an attorney in Minnesota called Andy Miner, and then Ted Hebert supposedly got the best birds, and then I got them from him. So this goes back to the 1930s or something in that range, and I'm like a fourth custodian of this. It also was the astounding, uh, the, well, the minor, the Andy minor line was the foundation for Mets and some of the other hackles as well. But I really like them. They have all these beautiful shades of color. I'm actually mating them on Grizzly right now. Just uh, get some done Grizzlies because that's a great seller. 
but they're really magnificent birds, much different, significantly larger than the Hoffman-based birds. Hey, a little bit more of a handful. Well, good. We've done a, the first of the winter review of some of the lines and the projects here at Whiting Farms. You can see some of the snow up in the Grand Mesa. We had a hellacious storm this weekend, Denver as well. But anyway, it's good to get in touch with this Cheech and Curtis. I yeah, almost said, almost said Cheech and Chong. <laughs> I'm sure you get that all the time. Yeah, where's Chong? Where's He's behind there? the camera. But <laughs> hopefully this this kind of uh, explains some of the mystery. You know, if it's a dry fly whiting line, tie with confidence, it's going to be a great fly. But you can kind of see as a geneticist, as Crazy Tom explained to yeah. us, you know why why it's important to to kind of keep the the strains separate. So. We're, we're all the better for it in the fly tying community. We're, we're super grateful for the work that he's put in on these birds. My pleasure. I'd do it for a hobby, let alone a business. <laughs> <laughs> I literally would. That's how I got into it.